Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Mike. Um, so you will have seen the format that we've got on the poster uh, for the session today. So we've got four people speaking, starting with Charlie. About 10 minutes each should be chance for discussion and questions at the end of each one. And then at the end of the session as well, will be a Q&A. So feel free to raise a hand. And uh, I think we're on Q&A rather than chat. So if anybody wants to pop anything in there as well, I'll keep an eye on it. OK, so over to you, Charlie. Thank you, Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, firstly, thanks, Sarah, for giving me this opportunity to come on and talk about my sort of entry into this career pathway in this industry. Um, so for anyone that doesn't know me, I'm Charlie Phipps. Um, so Microsoft Biz Apps MVP, um, but day to day I'm a Power Platform architect and developer. I kind of do a bit of both. Um, probably like all of us, you know, you get roped into different things, um, but officially an architect and developer. Um, I've come on today because my entry to the industry is quite unique, um, quite different. Um, so I've been in the tech industry eight years, despite only being 27. Um, so quite a bit of experience for my age. Um, so how I entered the industry was I left college. Um, so I, I did my GCSEs, then decided to go to college. I left college and I wanted to go to university, um, but at the time, times were hard financially. So I looked at alternatives and that's when I came across something called degree apprenticeships um, or sponsored degrees, as they were called previously. Um, these are worth looking at for anyone who's got, you know, nieces, sons, daughters, whatever it may be. Um, they're now government funded, but at the time mine was funded by an organisation. So I looked at these and I went for several interviews at some very large firms and ended up joining CGI, who was a large consultancy company, um, extremely large global, you know, 100 plus countries. Um, but they are very much in the space and defence sector. So they took me on, uh, which was great. So how that worked was I was sort of in work four days a week and then I was at university one day a week. So my studies were still carried out within the three years. So I was working kind of full time plus doing my degree. Um, probably the hardest three years of my life and my career, um, but probably the most awarding um, because by the time I had my degree, I also had three years of experience, which gave me the slight competitive edge against some other people at my age um, in my position. Um, and it also meant that some modules that were covered during my degree were work related. So it was kind of that whole apprenticeship feel. Um, and for me, that was great because I'm not very good at exams, despite achieving some exams now. I'm actually not very good at exams. I'm better at hands on and, you know, put me under pressure to put me on a project. And that's how I excel. Um, but ask me a question. I'll be like, uh, even though I probably know the answer, I just can't articulate it. So that was a better way for me to learn and get into the industry. So I started out traditionally as, you, you know, a tester being you know very basic click this script run this do this etc moved into the automation side of things picked up a few tools technologies moved into the management side of testing and then decided to take that a step further um, and move into development i was on a really cool project um galileo but uh, which is a european gps system due to brexit that got shipped off, UK was seen as a threat. So it was an opportunity to take on something new. Um, I was enjoying the development, mainly Java based. So I moved into software engineering um, for entering consultancy. Um, when I moved to my first gold partner um, of Microsoft, which was Productivity. That's actually when I entered low code, no code. Um, so not just Power Platform, um, also experiencing other tools like Nintex. Um, who were direct competitor at the time, slightly slipped off. But yeah, I was into the low code, no code, which for me was a blessing because I got a lot of headaches through Java development. Um, and I much preferred being client facing um, and the stuff that we can do with low code, no code, we all know about um, is much more creative. Um, but what 
really helped me in that journey was understanding the life cycle of software development, going from the testing background into the development background. You know, developers don't like testers, testers don't like developers. I had both sides of that, which was really cool. Um, so I learned a lot through my, you know, first job. Moved into consultancy. That's when I got that client exposure. Um, worked my way up in Power Platform before I sort of moved over to architecture. Um, and, you know, now at my current company, Akari, where I mainly do a lot more architecture. So I've gone from, you know, a very large firm to then a medium sized firm to what I class as a startup now. Um, and I think that's also helped my career because I've, you know, experienced uh, different challenges that you face with the different sizes of organizations, um, you know, different processes that some follow, some have really good ri rigorous processes. Some have no processes, um, which, you know, some of us have probably experienced the same thing. Um, and then, yeah, for the last sort of five years, I've really been a power platform. So the first three years was sort of more Java and, you know, testing development. And then it was sort of four or five years. Last years have been low code platforms. Four years has been mainly Microsoft, but the first year was sort of your click sense, your Nintex, your other tools, um, just so I had an awareness of what the other tools are out in the market. Um, and then because I was at a Microsoft house, that's why I chose to scale up on the Microsoft Power Platform. Um, and really, that's where my skill set lies now. Um, I've learned a lot through jumping between testing, development, and consultancy, and architecting. Um, and yeah, I think I think that's a good overview of my career. I think the biggest challenges I've faced um, have been being young, um, in the sense that like being young at the certain roles, they do come with challenges, um, but good challenges. You know, I've been in the past challenged by clients um, because you know before I grew this facial hair, I looked very young. Um, and they were like, who's this person coming on here as an expert or, you know, sold as an expert doing doing the job. Um, so, you know, it's not only challenges internally with your organization and other colleagues um, of our challenges with clients. That's all been overcome through, you know, the delivery. Um, I think the other big challenges for me was just I struggled in corporate place whilst I was younger. It was a great place to learn and move, but I found it harder to rapidly progress. That's why I slowly moved into the smaller organizations. Um, so I overcame that by, you know, understanding the process, understanding how certain different organizations work um, and giving me different exposure to the size of clients was useful. That's a bit about me. I don't know if anyone has any questions about my journey. I was going to just um, jump in and ask what advice you've got for anyone starting out now. Some things that you wish you'd have done at the start rather than later. Um, reached out to the community. So, you know, obviously I am an MVP. There's other MVPs on this call. Um, we are, especially within Microsoft, it's probably the one of the best communities I've been in to learn from. Um, best way for me, I wanted to become specialist in power apps so the way for me to learn was to go on the forums find out what problems people are having and solve those problems because then it was twofold i was helping people and i was learning um so that's where that's where i learned um and I'd, i learned best from getting hands on and the mistakes i've made previously are just trying to focus on you know getting this exam or doing this rather than being hands on and actually being able to demonstrate that I can do it and putting myself in a position where I'm not comfortable. So I've never I've never been comfortable in my career and that's how I plan to keep it because that's how I'm growing. So um, from from my point of view, if you if in self reflection, if you feel comfortable, um, it might be what you want. But if you want to progress, then I would challenge yourself. Thank you. Has anyone got any questions for Charlie? I've just got a well, an observation, and maybe, maybe, maybe another thing as well. So the the thing about testers hating devs and devs hating testers for me is like, oh, that's a real culture kind of management 
kind of issue really because it really should not be like that um, and the other thing is if you need somebody that's got a few grey hairs to front for you if you are finding that a problem then just give us a call oh, thank you I really appreciate that uh, awesome um, Dan do you want to take over for us thanks Charlie yeah sure thanks very much for that Charlie awesome awesome journey so um, similarly to, uh, to to Charlie, so I'm a I'm a Biz Apps uh, MVP. Um, I think where where our sort of journeys slightly the differ is that I've, I've stayed in the dynamic space. I think um, so. My focus isn't so much on the power platform, although it's something you overlap in all the all the time. So um, I head up the the Biz Apps team, uh, Enterprise Biz Apps team at ANS, um, and I think my journey into tech was. I would probably say fairly traditional. Um, so I came out of university. Um, I got a, a job at an end customer. I worked my way through the the ranks of IT, uh, from a database administrator to, you know, running teams and CRM and ERP platforms, websites, that kind of thing. And my transition point came when when I uh, uh, when I tried to change out or did change out the CRM platform within the, the, the business and we chose Dynamics uh, and at that point you know I, I geekily fell in love with Dynamics CRM and I've been here ever since so I've been uh, I've been doing Dynamics that was about 20 years ago so I've been doing it a, a fair while now um, and, and really kind of yeah, love love the love the community as Charlie said. It's a it's an incredibly vibrant and supportive culture uh, within this industry, which is which is really really great. So I, I wanted to take a slightly different tack. So I've got like a, a ten in ten kind of structure. So I was racking my brains after Sarah th thankfully put this together because it's it's really good to do these kind of sessions. So I thought, right, what would what would be what would be the ten things that I'd I'd tell my younger self if I was doing this today? So. Um, in no particular order, um, talking about uh, when you're starting off is find find where your passions lie. You know, don't be afraid of getting it wrong when you're making this first step. You know, there are when you're moving into tech consultancy. You know, there are so many positions. You know, Charlie's talked about testers. You know, there's project management, change management. You know, various levels of developer and architect, and you know, there are so many roles out there. So don't be afraid of dipping your toe in, trying something, learning something, because you'll always find that valuable. Okay, and then. If that's not the, quite the right fit or you want to experience something else, most organizations that you work out there, particularly in consulting, will allow you to transition and move horizontally to be able to experience different things. So don't stick your feet in, I would say, is, is my first bit of advice, and then be afraid to move on to something different. You know, there's lots of level 900 material from Microsoft, and what that means is it's foundation level. So there's there's lots of sort of broad and thin knowledge out there where you can get an introduction to different technologies if, if that's your your, your thing, um, and you can take a taster for where where something, is, where your passions lie. And I think it's really, really important because for me, if I don't get up and love what I do, every day um, that hurts so you know first advice find your passion second piece I would probably say um, uh, and this will this will probably repeat a little bit in some of my other points but is really understand the difference between knowing technology and knowing consulting we talk about tech consulting all the time and there's a, a very much a, a trend and a, an emphasis on knowing the tech you know get this certification get this certification but consultancy, the first part of that is to consult. You know, we are we are there as advisors. You know, we are there to, yes, we provide technology, but we are there to understand the customer, you know, understand their business, understand their pains. And it's very, very important that you don't just focus on the technology when you're moving into this sector. I would say, look at some of the human side uh, of things as well. Really, really, really important. Um, next up. I'd probably talk about we Charlie touched on uh, networking as well, and I think it's it, it can't be overlooked. You know, um, our community is absolutely phenomenal. We're always going to say that our community is the best, but I think it is absolutely phenomenal. And you know, sessions like this, to being able to actually help and encourage and nurture people um, in the uh, in the industry, but there's a there's an absolute wealth of information out there. 
and anyone breaking into our industry, I would say don't be afraid of, you know, being that person who's digesting uh, just digesting information through Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever your sort of social media it is, but start building up a network, you know, for all manner of reasons, you know, follow the content you like, follow the people you like, you know, connect up with them, you're able to ask questions, then you've got the, 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 the Microsoft communities and things like that. The more people uh, you actually get connected to, the more access to that support network you've got, which is going to help accelerate your growth. And I don't just mean from a learning point of view, like like anything, finding new positions and, and, and finding um, finding out about opportunities and things like that is is also about who you know, not just what you know. So having a really rich network is, is incredibly valuable. So I would say if you if you're not particularly heavy on any particular social media platform, you know, start building up your connections, start start getting that getting that content through because it really really will enrich your journey. The the next one is might seem like a really simple thing, uh, and I've just written find a mentor uh, uh, as a note for myself because you know it's it's quite common to find people battling through this on their own, you know, feeling that they they can't reach out and they they don't have anyone to talk this through because they don't know anyone in the industry. It's like chicken and egg. I want to get into the industry, but to get into the industry, I don't know anyone to talk to. So. I mean, the people on this call, you know, MVPs, people, people you you follow and you see content out there. Don't be afraid of reaching out to them and just saying, you know, is there any chance I, I can book in half an hour or something to have a chat and, you know, to, to steer me in the right direction or to give me some hints and advice? You know, mentorship doesn't need to be a long lasting lifetime relationship. It can be something that is tactical that helps and supports you at a moment in time. So don't be afraid of reaching out to people and just asking for help. That's a, that's a really big one for me. Um, the next one I wanted to talk about, if you're, if you're lucky enough and hopefully anyone on the call is taking this, this journey, um, I really hope you get to a point where you're going to interviews. OK, and my biggest advice here is again, it comes back to that technology and consulting. Is, be be yourself at that interview, and I and I don't mean that in the trite way of you know, be be your bring your bring yourself into the room as the as the best person you can be. What I mean is, anyone interviewing you knows who you are, knows your background, knows your knows your CV. They only already know your story, so don't try and pretend and portray yourself as like a technical evangelist, a technical expert. You know. They already they already know that this interview or this conversation is about somebody wanting to break into tech. So the things that you should be shining on, in my opinion, is, you know, your passion, you know, your drive, your willingness to learn, your 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 thriving to share knowledge and gain knowledge. You know, those are the kind of qualities that, that for me as a someone who interviews quite a lot of people. Even even when I'm ex uh, interviewing experienced consultants, they're still the qualities that I look for. You know, I can teach you tech skills. I can't teach you passion. I can't teach you drive, you know. So if you're coming to come into those interviews and you're energetic and positive and you give off that really good energy, then that's what they're buying into. You know, not not your technical skill, not because you've got six PL, uh, six level 900 exams or certifications already under your, under your belt. I can take you on that journey from the technical point of view. OK. So a couple of others is um, you obviously when you're on that journey, you, you're interviewing, you look, to, look to find partners or organizations that are going to support you. You know, I do some work uh, for the, the Power Platform skill that, that helps nurture people and get get people into technology from other backgrounds. So, you know, there are there are other organizations who do academy programs or graduate programs or career transition programs. So, you know, large or small, there's lots of organizations there that have got specific frameworks for people who are entering this this market, you know, to address the skill shortage. So don't think that you, there aren't any companies out there already doing that. So do your research, come and talk to, to people in the community, find out who uh, who those people are, because there already are schemes there to nurture new talent. You know, the the, the, the technical um, uh, lack of technical skills within our industry is no secret. You know, everyone wants to be able to support and nurture new talent within the within the industry. Um, and this 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 might be a little bit controversial, this one, Sarah. So. Um, I would say is go for culture over salary. 
particularly when you're going for your your uh, your first role when you're we're transitioning because the most important thing for me is you need to be in a safe environment that's going to nurture you okay so you know you some some might be lucky enough to get loads of high salaries uh, for for career transitions and stuff but you know with a high salary becomes a high responsibility you don't want to be dropped into an enterprise project uh, and literally learning on the job when you're doing that initial career transition. So ask some good cultural questions about the about the company. You know, what are their learning and development programs? What are their career pathways and how do you transition through through them? So find out about what the companies and organizations are you're looking at and see whether they reflect some of your ideals and principles and are going to support your learning journey. And my last 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 couple, and then I'll finish off with one, are more about around, around the technology. Now, obviously, I'm speaking from a Microsoft, uh, particularly Dynamics and, and Power Platform background here, but it may surprise you, and, and we, we know because we use them all the time, but it may not be apparent. There is so access to so many free tools. You know, you can get onto Microsoft 365 and you can get a development instance that you can play around and start messing around with. Power Platform has development licenses and environments as well, where again, you can get in, uh, and I think like Charlie said, you know, actually getting in and trying things and doing things is such a valuable learning part of your learning journey. So the knowledge that there is actually free tooling out there to support that journey, you know, you're not just reading reading rafts of material or watching loads of youtube videos and stuff this is actually you know there's physical tools you can get your hands on uh, and i'm sure sarah will, will distribute some links and stuff so that people can uh, people can follow up on that as well and hand in hand with that is is the free exams and training you know Microsoft and, and other partners do lots of things like um, in a day sessions. So, you know, Power Automator in a day, Power BI in a day, you know, Power Apps in a day. You know, they are sort of sessions where you can get hands on with labs, with guided people who are going to walk you through that experience. And Microsoft do lots of other events as well, you know, skills challenges. Quite often, all of these events and things like that, they have sort of free certifications attached to it, you know, for a, for a foundation level. So you can also get financial support there as well. So just by attending some of these workshops and some of these events. OK. And my last last point, Sarah, and then I'll, I'll, I'll hand over back to, to you for Q&A. But um, my last thing is a little bit about um, mental health. Okay, we talk about breaking into an industry. You know, this is something that can be absolutely overwhelming. Um, a lot of people use the phrase sort of drinking from the fire hose. You know, there is there is so much information. There is so much support out there in the, in the community. And when you're coming into the tech industry as a new person, you know, that's a flood, a wealth of information that can be quite overwhelming, you know, so moderate your learning and I would say focus your learning and make sure that when you're taking that transition, get some advice on areas where you should start with. Don't try and take on the whole ecosystem right away. You know, make sure you've got some structure and set some goals to how that uh, how that learning is going to happen. And that's my 10 in 10. I think 10 in 10. <laughs> Awesome. I um, totally agree with you, by the way, on salary and culture, especially in your first role. So important. It's a conversation I have a lot with juniors. Um, you know, the money will follow, won't it? If the, if the skills are there and the skills have been nurtured, um, then money will definitely follow. Um, Jamie, you've got your hand up there. Hi. I'm just, hi, sorry, it's a bit late. I've uh, missed Charlie's, but I've got to all of Dan's. Um, yeah, just to follow up on that salary, you know, I was did a move around employers um it's kind of a bit of a managed move but one on paper looked like uh like a 10 20 percent pay rise but when i then factored in all the uh long hours that were just expected of you it was actually a pay cut by the time that <laughs> uh you know as, as flying up to sort of like aberdeen every week um with sort of like no recognition that it was a slog <laughs> <laughs> to get there and but on the flip side of that it was part of my um gain experience um but but yeah so don't always go on the, the number go on like the culture as you say thanks jamie thanks jamie has anyone else got any questions for dan before we move on um i had one in the q a just earlier on sarah 
Um, oh, the question sorry, from Dan bad. is, no, no, it's okay. Uh, the question was, what advice would you give someone looking to come into like a management role similar to what you're doing? Ooh, good one. Um, or maybe three or four levels below what you're doing. <laughs> what you did ahead of. Um, it's, it's interesting. I think um, if we're talking about line management, I guess it would be first off, first off, sense check with yourself where that that line management is something that you want. You know, our industry offers many different routes. You know, you can follow a purely technical route through to, you know, enterprise architect if you wanted without those line management responsibilities. Um, if you, people often see management as a route to success, as a, as a route to promotion and that kind of thing. Um, that's not always the case. And if it's not something that is in your, um, not in, even your, your skill set, but in something that you actually want to do, and you again, you've got that passion for, you know, then maybe maybe choose the technical route. But if you if you do actually committed to to, to line management, people management, you know, that that cultural piece, then then yeah, ab absolutely. But sense check yourself before you make that move, because there are plenty of companies out there that will allow you to take a purely technical route without the ability to line manage. So that that. Does that kind of answer the question? I'm not sure who asked that, but. Um, sort of. So I was looking at more the the strategy side of things than the management side of things. And just want to echo what you said there on online management. It's, it is a big step going into something like that. Um, it's something I've done myself quite recently. Um, it's got its pros and cons. Um, more looking at like the, the sort of stuff that yourself, people like Will Dorrington, Chris, et cetera, that, outside of management rather than managing individuals, if that makes sense. OK, OK. So so I think, I mean, there are lots, clearly lots of overlap, depending on what kind of management background you've got. There's clearly lots of lots of overlap there. I think the, the advice would be understand the metrics and measures that tech consultancy are, are, are measured upon as opposed to maybe whatever whatever background you may be coming on. Obviously, it's quite broad. I don't know what what kind of management position that they will be coming from whether it's an end client or, or some other industry but you know the the metrics and measures are very specific to consultancy so get some background talk to some people about you know what what what's important uh for for people coming into uh, into the into the industry from that perspective and then you've got things like technology and um and methodologies and things like that you know we use lots of waterfall and agile type methodologies we talk about organizational change management you know we talk about change control like technical change control um alm processes there's a there's a lot to how we can run an efficient consultancy um out there um and those those are skills that need to be there so if you're not as uh, knowledgeable or rounded in some of those maybe not specific technical knowledge areas then i would say broaden your scope because when you get into consulting as i say you are just as much a business consultant as you are a technical consultant and you need a real rounded skill set uh, both with, with with obviously people process and the technology themselves um, and i think lastly in terms of you know will and chris and people like that that you know they're they're technically absolutely phenomenal you know i'm not going to put myself in in those the, those bounds but you know you do have to even as a manager you have to be hands-on you have to be technical you have to know your stuff you know this is this is a a fast changing industry you know and if you you've not got your finger on the pulse you know if you're not keeping up with the wave releases you know we've got stuart stuart on the call he does some fantastic sessions on, on that, that kind of thing it's all about you you need to know what you're talking about you need to live it and breathe it um you don't just manage people you know to gain that respect and and, uh, and to build a team out and build a reputation you've got to you've got to know what you're doing as well from a from a technical point great advice thank you thanks very much um angie you ready absolutely and thanks <laughs> for a busy day <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it's the the beautiful life of multitasking so it's it's great to see so many familiar faces and just so many people on the line uh and and just be part of the event as well so 
what I'll do in the interest of time, I'll do a little mix of just a brief background into my background, pun intended, and then I'll give some tips like uh, Dan did. So, uh, and the reason I really want to talk about my background, even at a high level, is because it's quite diverse. And what I realized throughout the, the, the years that I've been in technology is that um, we don't have enough role models that show the nonlinear paths into tech. And that can be quite challenging because, of course, we can imagine how a career can span from having a computer science degree to, to becoming maybe a SharePoint admin or a developer and then moving through through the, the skills and ranks. But not everyone has the same uh, path. And especially in this session where we're trying to explain the different careers uh, for breaking into tech and consulting, uh, we need to be very cognizant that diversity will happen and those skills should be celebrated. So either way, um, so I started as an economist. So my degrees are in economics because I was always a math geek, but I also loved um, the idea of being able to explain how the world operates, how humans operate, because economics is at its core a social science. Um, and I was so fascinated by the behavioral side of it that I realized that I don't really want to follow a career into maybe a bank into or economics consultancy at that point of time. I was young enough, and as uh, a few of you mentioned, it was time to take a few risks and to be open-minded. So that takes me to point number one, be open-minded. And um, if you're passionate and curious about something, uh, harness that. It's in those early years that you can really um, afford that in a way. So... I took that gamble in a way, and uh, pun intending again, I went into uh, bookmaking, it's essentially online gambling, uh, in the marketing sector, and that's how I fell into CRM. Now, at the time, I didn't realize how much I was going to enjoy it, but I started early on working with CRM systems, um, configuring them, and working on marketing strategy, and that was quite fascinating because I didn't realize it was this massive world of tech that was so fascinating and so versatile. So. There you are, 21, 22 years old, little clue about life, but somehow really enjoyed tech. And um, I stayed within marketing for, gosh, uh, I want to say four-ish years. Um, and it was very um, a very good time to build skill sets, which takes me to point number two. Think of your career as building blocks, as Lego. You're building skill sets, and that can be from different roles different companies, different industries. So keep an open mind about being a T-shaped individual and flexing enough to build those skill sets. So the way I viewed that industry and uh, marketing was that I was able to build a tech background. Believe it or not, the online gambling industry is extremely technologically advanced. And the things that we were doing, even at the time, so five, seven years ago, are just amazing and I have not seen in other places. Um, so um, I was able to build a communications background, a commercial strategy background, so how to operate a PNL, um, how to operate massive budgets and to build marketing strategies that you're owning, so commercial um, acumen, and of course, operating CRM systems, which was the best part because it got me so passionate about applications. And after doing that for um, a few years, I realized that, okay, um, I think I want to do this now in financial services. It feels like the right time. So I went into a, a, a bank where I was able to do this at a bigger scale and with different cloud solutions, again, within the CRM space, which was great because I was able to delve into a sector that I was um, always interested in, but I wanted to do it in my own terms. And then I started building a new blocks, which was around industry experience, um, operating at a global scale, how to build networks. So these were the new building blocks. Um, eventually, I had seen so many CRM systems and solutions that were terribly, terribly implemented. And being the end user that had to suffer through it, I realized, wait, there must be a better way. And that's what brought me into change management. I realized that I had enough knowledge of so many different CRM solutions and to the point where I wanted to do differently. And it brought me to the beauty that is change management, where we look at the human impact of the technology that we implement. We look at how different solutions can really empower users, empower businesses, and how true transformation comes to life. So that was um, a very nonlinear path. And even though I didn't realize at the time, I was following a, a story. So it takes me to point number three, know and build your story. Believe that your passions will 
um, are worth building on. So if you're finding there's certain skill sets that you'll get from a role that are building onto that story, be confident enough to tell it, be confident enough to attract the right mentors and coaches, very important, but also the right sponsors. And there's a difference between the two. Um, your mentor, your coach will be day-to-day -day helping you um, maybe sense check things and talk things out. But a sponsor is a very, very important person because they will actively help you in your career. For example, it might be a senior figure within your company that will sponsor you um, going up the ranks or achieving certain milestones that a mentor or a coach might not be able to do to other position or experience. So definitely uh, seek those two types of people out. The community is so uh, welcoming and so many people that could support you in that journey, but definitely bear that in mind. Now, consulting is an interesting um, side. Um, I've only been doing it in the last two years, but I've always been so passionate about what I do that I didn't necessarily see a massive difference. Um, that being said, um, it's important to have a business lens to what you do. Uh, as Dan said, we are providing consulting. It's not just we are technical experts and we don't always have to be either. It's about having a business acumen so we can strategically direct. That's the whole point. That's We are um, a, a fantastic person, the community said. We are selling reassurance. We as consultants are selling reassurance that so we can guide them on that journey. We might not always have the answers and sometimes it's not about only the answers or the end goal, but how do we take them through that transformation journey? In the case of change management, it's a journey from awareness to adoption. In the case of implementation, it's from the business case and the uh, original design all the way to release. So there's always a journey and we are helping them navigate that because there's only one constant in this world and that is continuous change. So um, the final thing that I wanted to mention is that, um, and it's not just for consulting, it's generally um, to be ready to be role modeling, not just diversity, but also vulnerability, because I think that's a power, especially as you're progressing through the ranks and then you're becoming a role model for others. Mental health is um, can be quite challenging sometimes to navigate, and especially when you're, um, I, I found personally as well, navigating the professional path but also the community you get so excited wanting to contribute to both that sometimes it can be challenging to manage your own mental load and to manage your own um, abilities so it's okay not to be okay as cheesy as that may sound so reach out to those that can help you navigate that and relate to you as well so um, keep you honest you know even if it's as simple as take lunch breaks to um a walking meeting, to um, just having a soundboard of a person that can really relate in those hard moments. So it's it's absolutely okay to be honest about it. And I really encourage, especially the more senior leaders to do it, because if we don't have leadership doing it, and that can mean any rank, then it's really hard to embed it within the company. So definitely, and hopefully, uh, all this inspire you to be the most unique, authentic person you can be. Gorgeous, that was brilliant, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> anybody, anybody got any questions? I think you're doing a good job of covering everything, guys. So um, there's not loads of questions to ask. But um, but yeah, we'll move on to Rosie. And I have to thank Rosie for John Russell mentioned doing an event like this to me a while back and Rosie sort of triggered this, this one today. So thank you for that. And over to you. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Sarah. I'm going to share my screen. I've just got a couple of slides to support what I'm talking about. So and um, just let me know when you can see it. You should just be able to see the presentation. We can, you see, can your see your notes. See a bit screen. more on the screen. You can see my notes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there we that's go. better. OK, perfect. I'm going to go to my other monitor then. <laughs> OK, so. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you again, Sarah, for organising these virtual roundtables. I think it's really fantastic what you do for the community. And also thank you to the rest of the panel. 
And to everybody that's attending, please do post any questions that you have or comments in the Q&A. Uh, we would love to hear from you during the session. So uh, let's try and make this interactive. So this is my introduction, a little bit about me. I am a BI developer at Maxica Consulting. I am fully self-taught and I started speaking at events last year, really as a way to give back to the amazing data and power platform communities that have helped me so much over the past few years. These are the links to my social media and where you can see a bit more about what we do at Maxica. Please do be welcome to connect with me. I'm really interested and keen to see what you're interested in and what you're working on. Now, I'm going to speak today a little bit about my experience of getting into tech. So three years ago, I was working as an online English teacher and really I was feeling unfulfilled and unmotivated. An opportunity arose within the operations team at the teaching centre where I worked to improve their reporting in Excel. Now, despite having never used Power BI myself, I was told that that was really the best reporting tool. So keen to grab the opportunity, I suggested that we actually migrate the reporting from Excel into Power BI. And that is where my journey began. Fast forward to today, I'm now working full time as BI developer. Uh, building software as a service solution using Power Platform, Power BI and Azure. So how did I do it? Well, I believe that there were really three key points to my approach. The first is that I believed that I would. So I decided that I was going to work in tech and really I became single minded in my pursuit of that. From deciding to teach myself Power BI, I'd actually discovered my passion. So what I would say, if you're looking to move into a technical role, believe that you can. And if you're just getting started, actually a really fantastic place to start is with Excel. It is the number one analytics tool in the world and it's available to almost everyone. I would really recommend that you expand your knowledge of its capabilities because you can learn so much about data analysis in Excel from manipulating data, using Power Query and VBA and even producing visualizations as well. And becoming a sort of master in Excel will give you a really solid and base understanding of when you move into Power Platform. So. I believe that I would, and you can apply this logic of belief to whatever your next career goal may be, whether you are looking for a promotion, as uh, others have asked on the call, or maybe you're making that first move into tech, find the belief that you are going to succeed and then go and make it happen. Now, the second key point to my approach is that I told people what I was going to do. So I spoke to my friends and family and colleagues and I told them I'm going to build a career for myself in tech. And by doing so, I made myself accountable. So if you can use Excel, then you can make the move into using Power BI and Power Platform as well. And you can learn all about these for free on Microsoft Learn, as Dan mentioned, and it is complete. It is completely for free. There is a whole wealth of knowledge in there, and it's a really fantastic place to get started. And if you've got that sort of grounding in Excel, PowerFX, the language used in Canvas apps, is an easy and manageable step to take for Excel users. You can as well, as Dan mentioned, make use of the free Power Platform developer licenses that are available to everyone. You just need a work or school email to get started using them. And as others have mentioned, the importance of networking. Now, networking helped me so much. It does now and it did when I first got started. 
when I first got started, I was really surprised actually by how many people wanted to help me. Colleagues from other teams that were willing to share their knowledge and train me on what they knew. But in particular, and I think everybody has mentioned this, I discovered the community. Because I was always working quite far outside of my comfort zone, I spent a lot of time looking up things on Microsoft forums, on Stack Overflow, watching YouTube tutorials, and just discovered how generous the community are with their knowledge. And because I've been doing that networking, I discovered that there was a BI team in the wider company where I worked at the time when I was getting started. So through networking, I got the opportunity to start working alongside them. And that proved to be a really fantastic opportunity for me. So what I would suggest is that if you work in a company where people are doing the job that you want to do, speak to them, offer to help them, tell them what it is that you're wanting to achieve and see if you can start spending some time with them. But if you don't have that team in your company, can you find a need for the skills that you're looking to develop in your current team? So, for example, is your team getting insight from their data? Can you improve a process that you're doing uh, every month or every week by building them a simple Canvas app? And you don't even need a job to get started. Maybe you have a hobby where you can start gathering data. So perhaps you're a runner. Maybe you can start collecting your 5K and 10K times using a Canvas app with Excel or Dataverse. And then the third and final key uh, aspect to my approach was I actually faked it until it was true. So there's a really famous TED talk called Your Body Language May Shape Who You Are by Amy Cuddy. And if you haven't seen it, then I, I definitely recommend to give it a watch. And in it, she talks about the power of fake it till you make it. And she finishes up by using an expression that really resonates with my own experience, which is fake it till you become it. So if you want to progress, you might need to future truth yourself. Say, yes, I can do that difficult task. Even if it takes you double the time, you have to spend your evenings on Microsoft Learn or read in Python for Dummies to make it happen. You're going to gain so much from committing and saying that you can do something which then forces you to deliver. I myself had the opportunity to take on a really challenging project about a year into my own journey. The operations team where I worked had this really time consuming process that they were going through every week and they were spending a lot of time. So I told them that I could automate it. I was really keen at the time to start learning Python. And by telling them that I could automate it, I'd push myself so far outside of my comfort zone. And I had to work many hours into the night to make it happen. But because I'd committed, I had to deliver. And I learned so much from that process. It's not to say that being outside of your comfort zone isn't scary, because it is. Uh, Susan Jeffers has this really great book that I would recommend that you read. And it's called, You probably many of you have heard of it, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Because imposter syndrome is real, so we may as well embrace it. And it doesn't go away. Working in tech, in this really fast moving industry, I, and I'm sure all of us are, continually reminded of how much there is still to learn. So, so that's it. And then the final thing I would say is about attending events. So when I first started attending events, I really felt like an imposter, but they are a fantastic place to, to learn and to network. There are loads of free Microsoft events that Dan mentioned, the app in a day or Power BI in a day, for example. You can attend user groups and these are a great place to get to know people if you have user groups in your local area. And there's big conferences and then, of course, the best events, Sarah's virtual roundtables. Now, if you have the opportunity, I would recommend that 
once you start to learn a bit and get into a position where you are uh, where you're getting wanting to be try to share your knowledge with others and that may be speaking at events or it may just be training a team member or a colleague but that process of sharing your knowledge really helps you to validate your understanding so to summarize the three key points believe that you can find the belief that you're going to succeed and then commit tell people what it is you want to do make yourself accountable and then fake it till you become it embrace the imposter syndrome and then before you know it you won't be faking it any longer i'll stop sharing my screen if anybody has any questions Thank you, Rosie. That was great. Um, and it's interesting to see the sort of pattern through everyone who's spoken today. There's there's quite a lot of talk about community and mentoring uh, and mental health as well. Um, and I know what you mean with um, events. I run events, but the thought of being an in-person event with all, you know, all these wizards, you know, of technology, I would certainly be feeling a little bit intimidated. Um, there is a question in the Q&A. It's quite it's, it's sort of a technical question. I, I don't know whether Dan, maybe you want to have a have a go or even yeah. someone from the, the audience as well, Stuart, maybe. I can take it if no one else wants to, but yeah. if, uh, if people are bored from hearing my voice, then by all <laughs> means, jump in. Not at all. <laughs> um, so, uh, so Danish, uh, what, I, what I would say on this was, um, I think to say you've got no project experience is probably um, it, it's probably not quite true. You know, in our everyday lives, we we are we are working on projects constantly, whether it's whether it's personal projects, you know, you're building a kitchen, you're renovating something, you know, there's always something that you can contextualize as a project. So utilize and draw on that as your experience. Um, but in terms of prep preparing for those things, it's about showing a, an awareness about what a project is. So, you know, a project has a scope, what you're trying to do. You know, it's going to take a length of time. You know that it's going to cost a certain amount of money to deliver. And what you're trying to do is deliver something of a consistent high quality. You know, those are the, the those are the bare bones essentials of a project and then start if you can talk talk around those particular principles and what you would do to manage those, you know how you would understand and identify what that scope is, what their need is from from a customer, then you can start talking about the principles of it and say, well, you can teach me and give me some experience, but I understand, you know, I understand how a project runs and, and understand the structure, you know, have a look at things like waterfall and agile, you know, the core two principle. Um, uh, project methodologies that are used in our space you know understand at a very high level what they are you know how they work how they differ from each other what are the principles of one over the other so with a little bit of research uh, and I think just drawing on your personal experience and going actually you know what I've not done a tech project but you know I've upgraded this or I've been you know I've, I've been asked to to uh, to uh, I don't know help out uh, help out with you know re-networking a building or something like that that's a project you know what challenges did he face how did he overcome them talk and draw upon that personal experience i would say um, can i add to that a little bit as well um one of the best pieces of advice i've got for for people who don't really have experience is create your own projects so i saw something recently at I'm really sorry, I can't remember who it is that was doing it, but there's one of the technical architects at Akari who is working with a friend who's a taxi driver. And that taxi driver wanted to get into tech. So he built himself a Canvas app. That Canvas app is useful for his day-to-day -day job. He pops in two postcodes and it gives him a fare, for example. So when people say roughly how much they think this will be, he can stick in the postcode where he is, the postcode where they go in and say it'll be about 12 quid, for example, that's a project. It's got a set of requirements, it's got an outcome, it's got a goal, he's got an amount of money to spend on it, he's got an amount of time that he needs it. That's that's exactly what a project is. So just kind of echoing what Dan was saying there, that's that's experience, that's something you could put on a CV, that's, that's demonstrable things that you've done, basically. So 
if you are struggling to find something, just have a think about a problem that you can solve for someone. Could be someone you know, or just make something up. A general common problem that you have and, and go from there. And that becomes your experience and you could use that to get a kind of entry level role maybe. And that's, that's everything I wanted to add. Thank you, Stuart. And thanks, Dan. Um, Sharon's got a hand up. Sharon, how are you? I'll go to Jamie then. Jamie, you on? Yeah, I've I've found uh, a quiet spot to <laughs> perch my phone. Just to follow up and also a couple of things that I mentioned you know, about doing your projects and I think a company mentioned it do projects that is something you know about because then what you have is all you need to learn is the tech skill you don't need to learn the domain skill so you know if you're trying to learn and you're trying to do a sales project but you don't know sales you've got two things you have to learn whereas if you've got stuff so my it wasn't when i was learning but when i wanted to refresh revitalize myself i did um i think i mentioned this to you before sarah i did one for football odds um, and I just built a um, model driven app that analyzed it. Funny Rosie said you work for bookmakers. I did get suspended from one bookmakers because my model was a bit too good uh, <laughs> with uh, what I was doing. So, yeah, if you're doing projects, use a you know, use something that you know about. And again, you know, I've been doing this with um, my kids, um, the COVID education. So I had no work experience like I had. So, how do we do their CV for whatever job? And it is. Everything break everything down into projects. You know, third line support. You know, is an issue is effectively project. Um, I know when I was, and the other thing is, look at the small stuff. I um, was working for an end user, and I got told for about a year I can't do consultancy because you've got you have you've only worked for one company. By the time I did my round robin of experience, I. Had, I found and did started consulting. I found out I always had that experience. It's just because I, I kept all that other stuff I did on the side, sort of out of the CV. You know, I was like the one big project, but but I'd done all these other things you do for an end user. <laughs> like I managed the printer contract, you know, um, which is, um, yeah. So so you know that is something to go in my CV, which I kind of downplayed. It was a tiny amount of time, but it was contract management. Um, so that that's something to do. And I think the other thing is that you know we talk about certifications. You um broaden your certifications. You know, I would rather have someone with once you've got like three or four dynamics and power platform certs, start getting your fundamentals in slightly different texts because you know you should, you know, once you've got three or four certifications in power platform, you pretty much know it sort of thing you know what i want to, what you need is particularly with consulting is knowing where you can go when power platform can't do it so having those fundamentals in other things also sort of like um support uh where you're going with consulting so there's a bit about not being too hyper focused at, at things and yeah and, and one just you know mentoring you know look look at the people you want to be that makes sense. So it might not necessarily be the people doing the presenting. It might be the person that asks the asks a really complicated techie question, <laughs> you know, or you know, um, or the person that's con you know consistently um, yeah, posting comments on people's LinkedIn posts that are like really supportive and you know are uplifting, rather than necessarily you know, it's not necessarily the people who are front and centre that um, are the only people who can be your mentor. Thanks, Jamie. I'll take my hand down. Sorry, I'm just on my phone, so I'm just a bit awkward. <laughs> <laughs> I think Sharon's uh, Sharon's free now. Can, can you hear me now, Sarah? Yes. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Hi. Sorry about that. A few audio problems. What I mean, what I would recommend Danish is learn the language. I mean, just like Rosie said, you know, fake it until you make it. Uh, PMI, the Project Management Institute, they have a number of basic courses that you can do for free with them. They will give you the language that you actually use so that when you then actually go in to the interviews, you talk about the projects you've done, like Dan's explained, you can use the same correct language 
that is expected actually in a, a, a techie. So basically what you're doing is you're taking a personal project that you've done, but you're actually framing it in the language that you would actually use on a, a technical project. So then you're actually showing A, you can run a project, but then B, you actually understand the um, uh, the, the the basic um uh actual um what sits behind those words so you know you're using in the, them in the right context and that will then actually show that you've got transferable skills i don't know anyone who learns as much as you sharon <laughs> <laughs> that's great thank you um there is another question in the comments from arif and i don't know who to pick on for this one so if anyone wants to volunteer um uh asking a question about a master's degree which one to choose anybody want to have a pop at that i can't i mean i can't i can't really uh, say to to help you out which which choice um I, I would say that you know a master's degree is not a necess necessary requirement is something I will say. You know, there's 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 people who are doing career transitions. There's people who you know are, are coming as school leavers into this industry. Um, so if you're feeling external pressure to to get a master's degree, again, I I recruit an awful lot of people. Whether someone's got a master's degree or a bachelor's degree or they've just left school, it's not really sitting on my radar. Just to give you my perspective of things, um, it's about who I'm who I'm talking to, their experiences, how they portray themselves. So you know, unfortunately, if you're interviewing with me, it'd be it's wonderful that you've got a master's degree, and I'm certainly not belittling that. But it wouldn't be a deciding factor as to whether I hired you or not. Just just from my perspective, I think in the power platform um industry especially i think going to university potentially won't keep you up to speed with the the changes that are happening um there's there's that debate which i've i've done a session on that as well actually with lewis baybot who is now working at a and s and doing very well from what i understand and and, and <laughs> i'm i uh, bang that drum as well <laughs> yeah jamie i think you're on that session actually <laughs> yeah <laughs> from memory um Awesome. Is there any questions for anybody else or any comments or feedback or debate before we wrap up? Fab, well, thank you everyone for coming, especially to the, the panel today. It's been a little bit uh, interesting getting the logistics sorted with the uh, last minute things popping up, but I, I personally found it really, really interesting. And from everyone being from different backgrounds and, and in different sort of times in their career there is still some things that flow through and I will follow up with this on the kind of common factors that have come up in, in the advice that we've had from everybody that's really useful um not not, not just to you lot but to me actually <laughs> uh, understanding your different perspectives so thank you so much and again Rosie thank you for for triggering this to happen well, it's my pleasure I'm so happy that we could do this I hope people have found it valuable yeah, we had a good turnout and um, this is recorded as well. So we'll get it. It'll be by the end of the week. Um, we'll we'll have it ready Ooh, to, one to hand. Sort of send out. Is there another hand gone up there? Has it gone? Oh, I think it might reaction. have converted into a clap. Yeah, I've done that myself <laughs> before now. <laughs> uh, thanks ever, ever so much to everyone for listening. It's been been great to great to be heard. Great, great to hear the discussion. Thanks again, Sarah, for hosting. Thanks, Dan. Thank okay, great. Well, everyone, enjoy your evenings and uh, 